Second to fourth November is not too far away and the Privacy Symposium Africa 2022, the fourth edition, will be coming through in Nairobi. Yes, we cannot wait. Strathmore University, thank you so much for all the partnership and the support for ensuring that we are going to have the fourth Privacy Symposium Africa, but not just that. We are also, you are also supporting the privacy engagements, the regional engagements that we are having. Like I earlier on said, we had the Southern and uh, the Southern Africa Central, I, I mean, privacy engagement, which did take place on the 24th of June, Friday, 24th June. It was a beautiful one where we were looking at enforcement of data protection in Southern Africa, a reality check. What exactly is going on in Africa? I mean, in Southern Africa. Today, we are having one, that is the 5th of uh, this month of August, we are having one for Eastern Central Africa. And this is particularly looking at what you need to know about your digital trail, privacy in the air of datafication. And much later on, of course, we will have the Western North Africa. Earlier on in one of the videos, we were asking people what they think about privacy and what it would mean to them. It totally is a different understanding depending on where you're coming from. Sometimes we give up data that is sometimes unnecessary. I mean, um, you're opening up a bank account and uh, what, what, what more irrelevant information would be there? You're literally giving all your data out. And I love one of the artworks that we just did have earlier on, which was saying, use my location of my place of stay to serve me better, not to trail me. Because at the end of the day, you could provide that information and someone uses it to be able to trail you and not necessarily to be able to serve you better. And in this context, as we go into the Kenyan elections, like I said earlier on Tuesday next week, it is very, very important that we discuss uh, data protection in regard to it promoting democracy. Uh, the mayoral elections in Senegal are just done. What are the lessons that we are getting from there? And we are also going to have Angolan elections pretty soon, Kenyan elections. What do we need to know about how data protection and the management of data online can be used to promote democracy, electoral democracy. But before we delve into the panel discussion, ladies and gentlemen, allow me invite the acting director, Sipit, that is Melissa Omino, to give us the opening remarks. Men, uh, uh, Melissa, a pleasure having you and over to you. Thank you very much, Mildred, um, for that introduction. And I thank everybody who's here as a guest um, for this East and Central African privacy engagement that is part of the PSA. Um, SIPIT is very happy to be hosting this in November, from the no November 2nd to the no November 4th at Strathmore University here in Nairobi. Uh, the PSA is a unwanted witness initiative, and we are very happy to be partnering with them in terms of hosting the event. As has been mentioned before, and in the interests of time, I think we should go straight to what our topic is today. And perhaps the question that people will ask is, what is a digital trail or what is a digital footprint? And as has already been described, this is basically the data or the links to the data that you might leave online doing what you normally do online. It's impossible to be present today. We are working, we are learning, we are conducting business online, and there are a number of um, privacy issues that comes along with that. This is where the era of data protection and data governance comes in. Now, our panel is a very are well distinguished and experts in the field of data protection, privacy, digital rights, and data governance, and they'll be here to discuss exactly which aspects of a digital footprint or a digital trail that would that we need to be concerned about when it comes to privacy. Well, Melissa, so we are able to hear you vividly well, but kindly requesting that if you could be able to turn on your video, would be a great one. We'd long, uh, long to see your beautiful face. So we can hear you, but would also love to see you. Well, I can't actually start my video because the host has stopped it. And Melissa, uh, um, um, I there? hope you can hear me now. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but would also love to see you. So please turn on uh, your video. I don't have, I don't have permission to turn on my video because it's been stopped by the host. Can you hear me? All right, Melissa, go ahead. 
Yes, so I was saying that in the interest of time, I'd really like us to introduce our panel here today so that we could discuss the digital footprint of our audience and how that affects their right to privacy uh, in the era of democracy. Melissa? Yes, Mildred. Um, I'm, I'm getting messages from, from the audience that they can hear me. I'm, I uh, think you have muted might be... yourself, but we can be able to hear you now. Please go ahead. Uh, I think the audience can hear me. There might be an issue elsewhere. Um, but in the interest of time, I think we should start with the panel if you can still hear me. Uh, Melissa, for giving us the time and a special thank you to Unwanted Witness, Amplifying Voices and Changing Lives for ensuring that this comes to first Prathmore University and uh, Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law, CPIT, for the short one, thank you so much as well for ensuring that this comes to press ahead of uh, the fourth Privacy Symposium Africa. Nairobi, we can't wait to be coming down there. Three days, over 50 speakers, more than 54 countries. We cannot wait to have this beautiful conversation coming through. But just before we go to the panel, we have uh, some poll questions that we would like you to answer. Uh, there are about three of those that we'll be giving. We'll be finding out the right answers to these poll questions at a later stage. So one of them is amongst those choices, what is the meaning of digital footprint. Once again, just choose one single one and you can tell us amongst those what is the meaning of a digital footprint. Quite many, so I won't be able to read them out, but read through and find us uh, a choice that is right. Um, second one is of the following, what are the correct tips for protecting your digital footprint? Also go ahead and make a selection out of those, uh, out of those three choices, which reminds me of, um, um, you know, objective questions where you just had to uh, circle out a particular alphabet to get the right answer. And finally, we are looking at which of those that have been listed is not a set of personal information collected when registering to participate in an election. Remember, I told you that we do have um, Angola and Kenya who are preparing for their elections in the shortest run. And uh, we, will, we will also be talking about data protection in the realm of of, um, electoral democracy because it is definitely very, very important. Ladies and gentlemen, we set the ball rolling with our panel at this point in time. Once again, my name is Mildred Tohaise and first, let's take a look at the panel of um, guests that we do have this afternoon. Let's start off with our very first panelist. Hello, Mildred. Can you hear me?
Right, coming from Uganda, part of our panel will be Becca Birikuja, who is, um, has been a practicing advocate for over seven years with experience in a number of areas, largely on compliance and regulatory matters in the information technology IT sector. I actually happen to be an IT student, so pretty much graced to meet uh, Becca Birikuja here. He's also currently the manager, licensing and legal affairs at the Personal Data Protection Office, uh, Uganda, which is, uh, whose role enables him to provide regulatory oversight activities related to data protection and privacy. He is also in his work with the Personal Data Protection Office. He is in charge of compliance and enforcement of the Data Protection and Privacy Act in addition to managing and coordinating the licensing program of the office. Quite a huge CV for Baker, but ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say a very warm welcome to you, Baker, and just say hello to us. A very good afternoon to you. And uh, are you looking forward to this discussion? Thank you, Mildred. I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon to our, to the fellow panelists and uh, the attendees. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. saying that because we are hosting this as well directly live from Uganda, the Pearl of Africa. Next on our panel is none other than the beautiful, brilliant Fatma Songoro from Tanzania in just a bit, of course. We'll be getting to see who Fatma Songoro is. Uh, can't wait to be speaking to her. And Fatma Songoro is a proficient attorney with a significant interest in data protection, intellectual property law, cybersecurity, telecommunications law, as well as corporate law. Now, she is excellently versed in data protection and privacy legal aspects on data, as subjects' rights, data protection principles and consent related matters as well as consent disputes. Um, I actually earlier on talked about you providing your data, but do you consent for it to be used? Now, Fatma Songoro has also worked with various commercial entities on conducting data impact assessments, managing data breaches, and developing data protection and privacy policies in compliance with industry-specific applicable laws, as well as guidelines. Quite a huge CV from Fatma as well, but ladies and gentlemen, allow me to say a very good afternoon to you, Fatma, and uh, thank you so much for joining us you can just say hello to us before we start uh hi everyone uh it's quite an honor being here today and this afternoon and sharing uh with the panelists and attendees uh matters on digital rights and privacy uh thank you so much i look forward to the discussion All right, thank you so much, Fatma. We can't wait to hear from you. We can't wait to hear from what Tanzania has done with regard to data protection and the implementation of the laws because they always say Africa is good at enacting these laws, but the implementation is where the problem starts. Next on our panel is another beautiful lady. Oops, I love the gender balance that is happening with today's panel. Rahab Magiri Juma from Kenya. Yes, I know that it is a beehive of activity in Kenya ahead of the elections, but we will be having Rahab Majiri Juma, who is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya with over five years of experience in ICT information communication technology industry spanning from um, privacy and data protection, public policy, as well as administration and corporate governance and regulatory reform. She has had the privilege of serving as a member of the working group on the development of policy and regulatory framework on privacy and data protection that developed 
themselves. The Data Protection Policy 2018 and the Data Protection Act number 24 of 2019. She has also served as the Secretariat um, to the Task Force on the Development of the Data Protection General Regulations, which actually went ahead to develop three sets of data protection regulations. And allow me, ladies and gentlemen, read out this. Number one was the Data Protection uh, General Regulations in 2021. The data protection, that's registration of data controllers and data processors, regulations of 2021. Then the data protection, complaints, handling and enforcement procedures, regulations 2021. And these regulations were actually published and took effect from the 15th of January this very year. Ladies and gentlemen, we are more than delighted to have you, Rahab Majiri Juma. And if you are with us, I want to say a special thank you for taking off time, your busy schedule, and just say hello to us. A very good afternoon to you. Good afternoon, Mildred, and good afternoon to my fellow panelists and participants uh, as well. I'm looking forward to having a very engaging uh, conversation with everybody here. Thank you, Juma. A pleasure having you, and we can't wait for your brilliant ideas. Next on our panel is none other than Santana Simiyu, representing from Kenya, another beautiful lady and brilliant, who is uh, serving as the Program Officer, Equity and Inclusion, Civic Space, Digital Rights, and Independent Media. She's actually a human rights lawyer with a uh, passion for constitutional law. And before joining the ICG, uh, ICJ team, she worked in two law firms, that is Asiema and Amadi uh, Company Advocates, as well as Mount, uh, Mount Show and Company Advocates, and did her pupillage at the Attorney General's office. She did the, uh, de de dedicates most of her time to conducting advocacy, research, project design, as well as implementation. Santana Semenyu is an advocate of the High Court of Kenya, Ooh, I love the selection of the panel. And she holds a bachelor's degree in law from the Catholic University of East and Africa and a postgraduate diploma from the Kenya School of Law. Very good afternoon to you, Madam Santana Simiyu. Thank you so much for joining us. Say hello to our, uh, our audience and fellow panelists. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. A pleasure to meet you all. I'm happy to be here. Uh, looking forward to the discussions. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Santana Simenu, for joining us. Next on our panel, we'll have Victor Capillo from Kenya. I definitely understand, and it will be a beautiful discussion this afternoon, especially with the events that are taking place in Kenya. Victor is a lawyer and a trustee of uh, Kitonet and is keen on research on emerging policy, public policy issues, and how they intersect with ICTs and human rights in areas such as the internet freedom, that is a discussion that is happening in Uganda as well, a new law that is coming through, governance, privacy, and cybersecurity. Um, Victor Kapia also manages Lomac Partners and is a researcher from, for the annual CIPESA State of Internet Freedom in Africa series. I think we're going to have a very good case study with regard to some of uh, the work that has been done. Victor, good afternoon. Say hello to us. <clears throat> Um, good afternoon, everyone, and a um, uh, pleasure to meet you all, and looking forward to the discussion. And of course, that's not all we have on our panel. We have Grace Mutungu, who is a researcher and a digital research expert, and will also be letting us in on this. But, but to our panel, I would like to, in no particular order, uh, start off with Fatma from Tanzania. And, and my general question to all of us, and I'll be giving us a chance to be able to answer, um, what is your assessment of the state of data protection and rights to privacy in East and Central Africa so far? You could give us um, a case study of what's happening in your country. So allow me to start off with Songoro from Tanzania. What is your assessment of the state of data protection and privacy? Uh, thank you, Milan. Uh, with regard to data protection and privacy, I think generally, uh, to Africa as a continent, I think we're making uh, pace. Over the last decade, there have been a number of countries that have enacted different laws with regard to data protection and privacy. But with Tanzania specifically, uh, the countries, we are yet to enact a law on data protection and privacy specifically. So, Padma, sorry for interrupting you, but I'm kindly requesting, could you be able to turn on your video? 
because this is being recorded okay. and will as, uh, as well love to see your beautiful face. Sorry for the interruption, you can go ahead. Okay, the lighting is not very good, but I hope it's fine. Okay, so as I was stating that Tanzania currently has no legal framework with regard to data protection and privacy. So we just have uh, pieces of registration that actually cover, I would say, very little aspect of data protection and privacy. So we are yet to enact a law. However, the parliament uh, currently legislating or under the way of making a data protection and, and privacy law, hopefully maybe before this year ends or maybe by next year early, we'll have a law in place uh, with regard to data protection in Tanzania. But I would say that the government and uh, different institutions and agency have been have taken on this agenda and there are several campaigns and education around uh, data protection and privacy even the president has publicly uh, stated that there is a need to enact such law in order for tanzania as a country to push forward with regard to digital economy and take place in ict and technology uh, thank you mildred shortly There are very many Tanzanians who are on the internet. Victor, what's the case in Kenya with regard to um, the state of data protection and privacy? Victor, Victor. also remember to turn on your video. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I think for the case of Kenya, we are, uh, we've made progress in the past Three years, we have a new data protection law, we have a data commissioner, we have a number of uh, regulations that are currently being implemented. And um, so the, where we are at is in terms of um, implementation, how can we make the text of the law come to life uh, by making sure that the rights of data subjects are respected and the institutions that have been charged with the responsibilities actually carry out their, their roles. So that's what we are, that's the dilemma that we're currently uh, battling. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. I do not know whether there is any difference in opinion from Rahab Juma with regard to your assessment of data protection and the right to privacy across East and Central Africa. But of course, I know that there would be a case in point for Kenya. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, Mildred, for that question. So um, the lighting on my end is also not um, that good. Uh, it's quite a bit chilly where I am. So let me just start by listing out some statistics. So in Africa, we have a total of um, 33 countries that have enacted data protection uh, legislation. And uh, this uh, number actually increased significantly from 2018, I think where we had around less than 10% of um, countries in Africa that had um, any legislation on data protection. We had, uh, the, the, uh, I remember when you were drafting our law and we were doing research in terms of um, African countries that had data protection laws. I think there were about 12 with uh, Ghana taking the lead. We had um, Mauritius, we had South Africa that had uh, a data protection act. I would say in the last, four to five years, there's been a significant improvement um, with African countries actually enacting data protection laws. Um, so that's a total of 30, 33 countries in the continent that have data protection laws. Um, we have six countries with draft laws, and then we have 10 countries that don't have uh, any laws, and then um, there's no data available on five countries. Um, so I think in terms of the state of data protection in Africa, we are doing good for ourselves as a continent. Um, I can say the future is bright when it comes to, um, to enactment of data protection and having the right to privacy actually being recognized, uh, not only for each country, but uh, as, a, um, as a continent. Um, um, in terms of uh, Kenya, I think um, um, speaking from the perspective of um, a country, we, we have seen significant uh, effect with the enactment of the Data Protection Act, uh, both uh, from the public and the private sector and an effort for everybody to actually comply. So going forward, what we expect to see is the regulator coming into place and implementing uh, the aspects of the law that require compliance. Uh, 
So I'd say that's it from my end. Thank you very much. Let's cross over to the Pearl of Africa. Baker, what is your own take on uh, the state of data protection and privacy back home in the Pearl of Africa? We know well that there is a new law that is being enacted, uh, a new law that is going to be discussed in the parliament of Uganda pretty soon with regard to how internet is used. Baker, over to you. Okay, thank you, Mildred. <laughs> Hopefully better. So uh, in Africa, uh, you, as uh, uh, the Kenyan counterparts have talked about, there have been very many laws which have been enacted, but specifically those that have gone ahead and enacted them, they're still at the implementation stage of creating awareness. It's just a few countries that have gone into uh, receiving complaints and, and enforcing the law, but back to Uganda, the law that you've talked about uh, the, they're trying to amend the Computer Misuse Act, but we already have the Data Protection and Privacy Act, and it was passed in 2019. What we've done in Uganda, we've already started implementing with the first activity of registering. Um, the law requires every person, be it public or private, to register since it's the foundation of compliance. Uh, over 423 have been registered. We've also uh, been receiving complaints and uh, resolving them. The complaints that we've received over the past uh, about nine months, there are over 200. So, but we've also conducted audits, uh, about 15 audits, and we've also conducted investigations. So we've made a bit of headway in implementing the law in Uganda. Of course, plus the awareness, those we've conducted over about 150 as of today. So that's the, uh, current situation in Uganda. Thank you very much, Becca. I think you mentioned a very, very key aspect happening that we are all at implementation to a greater percentage in many of the African countries, still making people understand what these data protection laws are about and how important they are for not only personal security, but also public, uh, the public sector as well. But let me get the context for Kenya still in the eyes of um, Grace Motungu. What is your own assessment across the various African Eastern uh, African countries that you've paid attention to? And Grace, don't forget to put your video on. Grace Mutungo, are you able to hear me? All right, sorry, I think Grace is not yet with us, but let me get um, uh, Simeo's views, Santana. Uh, in your own perspective, are we on the right course with regard to the discussion about uh, data protection? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, as my colleagues have mentioned, yes, we're making good progress with regards to the implementation of laws. However, in practice, there's still a lot of surveillance all over East Africa. There's still a lot of surveillance, particularly through interception of communication. Uh, and uh, it's always under the disguise of national security. So, um, however, the problem with this is the, the security officers use their surveillance power to, to target dissidents such as activists or, or opposition politicians. And then also um, there's the issue of the, there's, there's still, a lot of, um, there's lack of anonymity. Uh, let's say for example, uh, most of the countries in East Africa, I would say uh, usually require the registration of SIM cards. And this involves uh, the getting, getting a lot of personal data in, including biometric data. However, um, still this is another mode of surveillance because I believe there's no anonymity between the communication of persons and it can still be a way to target people, to monitor people. So yeah, there's, there's a lot of surveillance in East Africa. And, uh, and as much as so far, three countries in East Africa have enacted laws, that is Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Rwanda. Uh, and uh, most of these laws largely borrow from the, the EU GDPR. So, they have the, the data protection principles. And there's one of the principles is um, um, it forbids the cross-border transfer of, of 
data of personal data. However, this sounds good on paper. Uh, I don't know in practice what safeguards are there to prevent this because the states might actually be transferring personal data uh, without our knowledge. Thank you. This report, which was offered, uh, authored by Kicktonet, which particularly looked at the relationship between data, uh, personal data, and then the 2022 Kenyan elections. First of all, let us in on the aim of uh, this report. What were you particularly looking at, and what are the key findings from that report that you could share? Um, thank Victor. you very much. Uh... Yes, I don't know if you can hear me now. Yes, able to um, hear you. Yes, uh, one of the things that we want, were looking at is one of the key things that drove us to this study is uh, that over the years, uh, in previous elections, we had seen uh, a lot of privacy violations uh, by different actors uh, in the election process. And uh, with the coming into force of the Data Protection Act, we want to investigate um, just how uh, what would be the implications of the new requirements, the compliance requirements that were brought in, put in place by the Data Protection Act. So uh, that was generally the goal, uh, is, was basically to see would the coming into force of the Data Protection Act result in uh, changes to how we conduct elections and how players within the uh, electoral space conduct themselves in terms of how they deal with data. Mm. And um, in, uh, in the course of the study, uh, a number of things we were able to find first is that there was rampant abuse of uh, personal data uh, by political actors, whether during the campaign process, uh, you know, through, you know, unsolicited messages that were sent to people. We had uh, political targeting on social media and profiling, which had already been used. Uh, even within the agency itself, uh, the, the election management body, the IEBC, Independent Electoral Boundaries Commission, um, the institution had not uh, put in place measures to comply with the provisions of the Data Protection Act, including uh, conducting a data protection assessment and putting in place security measures um, you know, to protect and safeguard uh, the data, personal data in the register. Uh, just for the sake of viewers from the region is that Kenya has a biometric, elect a digital biometric uh, electronic uh, or electronic register, uh, which is biometric based. They collect your names, your personal details, your photos, um, and this information is uh, could be accessed uh, by any person. You could pay 20,000 and get the copies of the entire register with access to all everybody's information. And they had put measures to safeguard that information. Uh, Individuals, uh, ordinary citizens could find themselves registered to political parties which they are not signed up to. And the, the registrar of political parties are not put in place measures to ensure that political parties um, and even itself had measures to, uh, to safeguard the information about uh, voters and political party aspirants and uh, you know, members of political parties that it had access to. And uh, lastly, just to highlight a few is that um, there were members of the public um, didn't have sufficient knowledge and awareness of their privacy rights. So you find that uh, nobody could complain. And also you can't blame them because there was no institution really. Uh, the commission, data commissioner's uh, office had not been established. But so now we were looking at saying, okay, with now the office, with now the new law, what could be, what could be done? And um, based on the findings, we did share these findings with the commission and the data commission. And we hope that uh, they will take measures, some of which we recommended, including uh, putting in place, um, you know, conducting the data protection impact assessment, putting in place data privacy policies uh, across uh, the electoral management body, political parties, the registrar political parties. Um, you know, the data commissioner to take measures to investigate um, and, you know, uh, address complaints relating to data breaches. 
and even compliance requirements, including the registration of these data controllers and processors, and closer monitoring of their functions. Just to mention that you know the election managing body in 2017 had data of 19.6 million voters, and in 2022 this has risen to 22 million voters. And this is personal information which uh, requires uh, to be accessed by you know political parties, and they are also collecting information of uh, candidates, who, which are around 16,000 candidates across different positions. So we felt that it was important for the Commission to conduct a data protection impact assessment and also an audit of how its practices uh, comply with the principles of data protection, um, you know, such as privacy by design and security by design. Uh, one of the requirements under the election uh, law is that uh, the election body is required to put uh, the list of uh, registered voters uh, in every polling center. And we have more than 45,000 polling stations. So you can imagine everybody's data will be put on the notice boards. And uh, we were asking them to redact the information because um, you don't have to put all the information of voters uh, splashed out across the country because this is contributing to abuse, which you have seen, uh, especially with the rise of uh, social engineering um, uh, crimes and uh, you know, cyber attacks uh, in, in, in Kenya, which have been rising because of uh, mobile phone fraud. And if you put people's numbers across the country, then you can only imagine what, what can happen. And of course, there were issues relating to the commission's internal processes relating to how they handle personal information, uh, issues around access control, who has access, who can edit, who can transfer, and uh, whether the individual voters uh, rights to uh, update their information, to change their details, and even to query the records uh, can be possible because in 2017, the body uh, uh, removed the, the ability of citizens to query the register. And uh, when they did put it, uh, it had massive loopholes, which uh, meant that any person could access the entire database and download the whole information, which they since uh, rectified. And now they put two-factor authentication. Uh, where you only need to ID and the date of birth, the year of birth to, to that. So uh, those are some key highlights of the research. And we hope that um, as we march to the election on Tuesday next week, um, we shall be observing this election uh, to see how personal data is being handled and also um, to see whether the commission has actually um, taken steps to, um, to comply with the provisions of the data protection law. Uh, just uh, three days ago, they released the results of the audits uh, from the KPMG, uh, which was done um, in the past three months. And uh, some of these concerns were also highlighted by KPMG. And we do hope that uh, in the course of the election, they will demonstrate to Kenyans that they have taken steps to rectify the challenge. Thank you. Very um, in-depth report. I would particularly want as a journalist to get a copy of that report and be able to munch on uh, a bit of the statistics that you did get out. Let me go to Tanzania. Fatma, there is this pervasive kind of um, assumption that an election can either be won or lost by particularly a candidate or a party who has the data and knows well uh, the preferences, we would say tests, uh, tests and preferences and behavior of the electorate. Now, what do you think are the actual implications of um, data-driven elections? Because that seems to be the path that Africa is taking. Uh, thank you, Mildred. So I would like to partly agree that election can be won or maybe not won by data. So as we all know, currently due to the digitization and the world moving into more technology, a lot of election, uh, democratic election actually happen through use of data. And even Africa is moving toward that direction. It's obvious commonly around uh, America and other country, uh, developed countries, but we're also moving toward that direction. So when we talk about data-driven election, this are election where uh, political parties or people who are candidates in election actually use people's data to actually be able to move their votes, maybe to actually not to vote for the opponent, or maybe to vote in their favor, or maybe to, to find voters who are undecided with regard to their vote on, on the election. 
So for political candidates who have data, and most of this data is actually personal data, it's either consumer data, it could be all its voter data, whereby as the previous uh, speaker actually said, uh, political parties can actually sometimes uh, unethically, illegally buy data, maybe it's uh, from uh, different access, it could be from uh, even the data that we write uh, maybe you're entering a building, you write your details, they could access your number there, or they could buy uh, the, the voters' registration uh, details from different institutions. So once they have that data, it actually gives them the ability to use uh, people's personal data to conduct uh, voter surveillance or uh, analytic of uh, personal data and actually come up, come out with uh, maybe let's say uh, micro targeted political ads which normally are targeting a specifically new video based on their personal data or their preference or their experience so this uh this also comes back to the digital trails that we normally have online maybe our behavior our engagement on online actually also leave a trail that maybe can be used i think we have had like facebook scandals Cambridge Analytica and uh, other other circumstances where actually data has been used and uh, for the benefit of uh, maybe a political parties or uh, other actors. And so the biggest question comes like when this political party use uh, our personal data to actually maybe target us in their political campaigns or to actually maybe register us as their uh, political party members, well, we are not. Where do they get this data? How do they access this data? Do they get them through the lawful means of processing data? But in most instances, I think it's uh, the data is obtained through not uh, the lawful processing of personal data that normally the law requires. And so, even though we, the internet and actually the data driven uh, election, offers a very big opportunity for political parties to actually reach maybe their potential candidates. And the political parties have a right to actually uh, conduct their campaigns online. But then the question, they, they need to be, there has to be a balance between the right of privacy and the right of political parties to engage uh, with the public. So this is where uh, the regulators, I think, and the state and laws normally actually need to come in place so that whenever uh, political parties or political actors are actually using personal data, they use this data in a way that is actually in compliance with the law. So there has been, uh, I think even though there, there are myths and reality with, re with the statement that uh, data-driven election can win an election or not, there has, be, there has been a view whereby people have said that uh, most of the time, uh, that a different election actually just persuade the undecided voters. And if I am a firm believer of a certain political party, no matter how uh, how much ads I get, how much misinformation or disinformation I get, maybe I still believe in a certain political party. It will not move uh, my view, but they're mostly the undecided voters that can actually be reached through this uh, that are driven uh elections or campaigns whereby they're targeted so with regard to the different election i think they pose a threat uh with regard to people's privacy and uh our digital rights and data protection so because the personal data actually becomes a commodity to these political parties so this is where normally it results to data breaches data misuse or data destruction maybe another opponent could want to destroy the database of another opponent. So there have been incidents like that, and they also result to a lot of uh, spreading of misinformation or disinformation, whereby through AI and technology, a person could design a certain message targeting a certain ethnics or maybe a certain group of people using their address was they actually know these people belong to the same uh, address through maybe accessing their zip code or location address and stuff like that. So there are a lot of uh, challenges with regard to data driven elections. And I think 
as Africa, as we, we, we want to take opportunity and use uh, this platform of data driven election, because I think it actually sometimes uh, reach out to bigger people, you're able, political parties are able to exercise their right of campaign uh, and reach a wider mass. But I think it has to be in a way that actually respects the right to privacy and uh, respects the data protection laws. So I would say that the, the, the negative impact can be overcome by actually having laws in place and having election law that actually provide for data protection or provide for handling of uh, voters' uh, uh, details and register because for instance in Tanzania actually there is an electoral law and currently we are actually we, we are able like to check about your registration uh for your voting if you're registered to vote and all that but there are no law and we don't know how that data is being processed we don't know who is having access to that data we don't know who is able to just sell that data maybe to a political party and this could actually result to us being targeted by uh political actors also i think the other thing will be about the the need to have like a fact check uh whereby in countries i think like gambia uh, i think during the election there were a lot of disinformation which re resulted to them actually uh facilitating or establishing a, like a fact check so whereby even though we get this uh, uh election uh campaign ads or information but we're able to actually uh maybe verify find ways to actually verify and i will also say the other thing will be about actually conducting data impact assessment prior to the election and also data audits maybe as uh, the election are done so when this data driven election are happening we actually can tell uh the impact or and maybe understand like what happened with the the exact uh data uh, driven uh, elections. And I think as Kenya is actually currently undergoing uh, its election and they have a data protection law in place, I, I, I hopefully maybe after the election uh, has passed, we'll be able to see maybe if uh, there is, has been a contribution with regard to the data uh, driven election from Kenya if the, 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 the data has played any law, role with regard to the vote maybe in Kenya. And I would also just like to say that as we are all actually responsible for our personal data. So as we are trying to embrace the, uh, the use of data in the political space, we also have a role to actually play to make sure that these elections actually uh, undergo in a way that is safe. So I can say at mostly, I, I believe that the elections, maybe the data-driven election can somehow steer the election. And this maybe might result uh, even sometimes to due to misleading of people. So people might act or vote in a certain way just because of uh, the, the, the effect or the impact of the data-driven election. And so it could result with someone winning an election uh, due to them having better access of uh, the uh, having personal data of people and using that personal data maybe to persuade or actually uh, reach out to, to them and engage them in a certain way. So yes, simply that's what I would say. You mentioned a very key aspect when you say that um, we are all responsible for personal data. And especially when you do suggest that probably there could be a data impact assessment uh, prior to the elections and also at some point in time have an, a data audit, probably later on after the elections. Thank you, Fatma. I'll be coming back to you in just a bit. Baker from Uganda, how has the data protection um, you know, office been able to uh, plan to regulate a digital political campaigning because that seems to be the order of the day that seems to be the now and the future but this to be able to avoid um the violation of the standard norms of data protection i want to just give a case in point um university elections of makerere after the unfortunate incident of a, a student who was killed and it was uh, said that now elections were going to be online like it was during the COVID 19 season but how do we not um violate the standard norms 
terms of data protection as we try to promote this online and digital campaigning. Thanks, Mildred. Uh, we've already taken some steps in that regard. Uh, we've engaged the Electoral Commission as the body that is in charge of monitoring uh, national elections in Uganda. And we noted that before uh, the campaigning goes online, it usually starts with the voter registers that are given you know, to the candidates, um, their agents, those that are involved in the electoral process. So these are uh, voter registers, uh, we engage the electoral commission and we looked into uh, some of the uh, practices that are involved around you know, handing over these. So they informed us that they sign agreements with uh, these agents and the candidates before they are issued. Becca, I apologize for um, interrupting you, but could you kindly turn on your video? Okay, my bandwidth isn't very good. Uh, if you can allow me okay. to go on okay. with that. All right, go ahead. Without the video. At least I have my photo on. <laughs> That's okay. It's a, it's the right, uh, you know, it's That's a true likeness of what I look like. <laughs> okay, okay, go thank ahead, you. Becca. So uh, we, when we engage the officials from the Electoral Commission, they told us that before they hand over these uh, voter registers, they sign uh, MOUs, Memorandum of Understanding, uh, with these various parties. So we advise them to include aspects uh, of data protection beyond just having a clause of uh, make sure that this information is kept confidential so that it's more uh, elaborate on how they should use this information, how they should display it, and where how they should dispose of it uh, when the season is done. So going back to your question of uh, ensuring, you know, with the digital campaigning. So with the digital campaigning, and uh, as we, it is with any democracy, uh, campaigning is really reaching out to the individuals, communicating your message. But now online, the message can actually be done at a much faster pace. So collection of this information, um, how, what we've been doing, the law requires that any person that's collecting a personal data bid for campaigning or electoral purposes, you're required to register with the office. So we require these um, agents and these parties to register with us. Now, when you're registered, we give them compliance tools. Now, these compliance tools include uh, aspects of um, how to develop a privacy notice, letting individuals know how you will collect the information, which information you will collect, and how you will use it amongst others but also developing data protection policies, whereby those involved in the campaigning process, they should be made aware of, of their responsibilities. In case you have these water registers, you're reaching out to people, those that like the particular party or candidates page uh, or using the social media platforms, such information when it's gathered, how is it analyzed, with whom it's shared with. So that's what we've been doing to assist and improve with the compliance. But also there is a key area where uh, still part of uh, uh, the compliance mechanism, we require them to have a complaints handling mechanism. So even if you are campaigning using the digital platforms, make sure that you actually at least avail a number that people can use to reach out to you, or at least you, let's say you're using Twitter, you should open up your uh, DM direct message so that people can, you know, probably those that feel you're mishandling their information, uh, they can reach out to you and keep a record because they we also encourage them to be mindful of the timelines within which such complaints should be resolved because the law is very clear on when you should do that and also letting know uh, these individuals know that in case they are dissatisfied with uh, the way the information is handled or the decisions they've taken they can always reach out to us so that's the mechanism that we're using to ensure that even even during the election period, people that use digital campaigning, they can still be compliant with the law. And uh, we also give them tools to assist them to do exactly that. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Becca. I think that is elaborate, but however, it's a tough line between allowing these political parties signing MOUs 
and another one of actually implementing. And you earlier on talked about the issue of uh, the people not having enough information about their digital rights, but I will be getting to that at a later stage. Grace Motungu, let me come to you in the perspective of Kenya. We know that um, democracy is increasingly mediated by digital technology. Come to think of issues like electronic voting, biometric registration, uh, even if it is police surveillance, they're using the internet, they're either using social media, uh, we've seen countries whereby social media has been shut down when it comes to elections, case in point, Uganda here in the last elections. But um, what data protection enforcement challenges do you think East, Af uh, East and Central Africa actually uh, face? And how can these be dealt with? How can we overcome them? Um, thank you so much for having me, Mildred, and for the question, and good afternoon to um, everybody um, joining this um, conversation. Um, I, I do uh, pretty much agree with uh, what the panelists before me have uh, uh, said, especially with regards to um, the should I say lateness of data protection laws because they are only coming in now while digital technologies have been with us uh, for quite a while. And I'd like to say that there are many challenges, but one of the ones I'd like to highlight is the um, connection between uh, data and um, access to government services and also um, national security. So um, in a lot of African countries, um, and if you take the example of, uh, of Uganda, Kenya, you find that um, there are now digital IDs, uh, which collect a lot of personal data and um, which are now being used for access to government uh, services. Um, and, and you know that the state is very, very key in a lot of um, services in, 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 in the country. So, for example, in Uganda, there's the um, social protection services, health services. Uh, now you need digital ID to access them. Similarly, in Kenya, from um, education to health services, uh, like the national insurance, um, to even entering a building, you need digital ID. So I'd say one of the greatest challenges is that the data protection laws that we have already exempt national security functions from all the or from full provisions of data uh, protection so uh, a national security function does not have to have um, to have followed all the provisions of the data protection law and how that um, now comes into play is that uh, uh, national security services are collecting and, and starting to use uh, personal data even before we negotiate uh, the law and then also um, they take this exemption, they use it to, um, to overreach uh, even when um, implementing the law. So even when the law provides for something like a data protection impact assessment, which is basically to say that even before you use uh, people's data as a, uh, as a public agency, you should first think about how that data use will affect people's rights. Will it mean that people will not be able to access education or to access um, food or to access medical services? You should think about these things before enacting the law. Uh, but what is happening is that um, the, the agencies will either do a very, very, very minimal data protection impact assessment. And because they'll do that, they may, they, the assessment themselves, they will always assess themselves as, um, as being good uh, data users and, and only say that um, they are not at high risk. And so in practice, this means that we have a data protection law on one hand, but it is taking away the rights. On the other hand, when, when the, um, the uses of that data are linked to, national security um, uh, services. So in that way, data protection um, or, or the lack of data protection, the lack of, of good implementation of data protection takes away real rights like the right to health or the right to education, the right to social security and so on. So that is a really, really big challenge. And I think it is a challenge that would be overcome if we had more independent uh, data protection authorities, but this is also 
a challenge which I'm sure uh, given another opportunity I can uh, elaborate on. to be looking into because many a times the governments will extrapolate or talk about highly um, security of the country and yet in, 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 in another world are trying to step on the rights, the data rights uh, of the citizens on digital media. Let me cross over to Rahab um, and from, from Kenya still. Do you think that our, our data protection um, laws, specifically in Africa, you did clearly mention that we do have about only 10 countries that haven't enacted, about 33 of those have enacted and six have a bit of drafts. And um, do you think that um, it is sufficient, these laws are sufficient enough to regulate the ways in which data is generated by voters and how it is actually utilized? And do you think there are any gaps that need to be closed with regard to what data is accessed, how it is used. Um, thank you, Mildred, for that question. Um, so when it comes to the sufficiencies, uh, sufficiency of the laws that we have in Africa, I do believe that the same are sufficient. Um, I think the challenge comes in with the aspect of the implementation of that specific law. Um, so, for example, how do countries, and um, I'll speak specifically to us as Kenya, how do we go about implementing the data protection law that we have? Because we have to balance uh, between the various rights that individuals have, and then also we have to ensure that we protect the right to privacy in instances where the right to privacy actually does um, take precedence over any other rights that entities may have. So a good example, um, like for the upcoming elections that we are having, um, the regulator, uh, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner came up with um, a guidance note um, that was addressed uh, to political parties or, or entities that rely on personal data for political purposes. So the, the guidance note elaborated on um, what uh, the expectations of these various entities would be setting from um, um, the uh, body that's responsible for conducting elections, that would be IEBC, all the way to the political parties, um, the register of political parties that registers any political parties, and then all the way to the data subjects. So we need to, uh, implementation speaks to having a framework in place that will recognize the need uh, of all these entities and the specific roles that they serve. So IEBC will need the data of uh, Kenyan citizens for people to be able um, the registrar of political parties has specific obligations that they have to comply with, and also um, the people who are vying for, for political elections as well have specific responsibilities, be it as data controllers or data processors that they have to comply with. And then we have the data subjects at the end of the day. At the end of the day, so how do we come up with a framework that appreciates the rules of all these entities, and at the end of the day, still respects the right of privacy uh, of the individual who's concerned, of the Kenyan citizen who's going to be carrying out um, voting at the end of the day? So let me just um, start by painting the scenario. Um, back in 1998, uh, um, Kenya had um, an election. Um, this was during the Moi regime, um, our former president. And um, how those elections were conducted, it was called Mlolongo. And what that meant is that someone would hold up um, the picture of your candidate or your preferred candidate, and you'd go and sit behind that specific person. Um, based on that specific situation or that specific scenario, ideally, there was no aspect of privacy when it came to you actually voting because everybody would get to know and people would use this information to your detriment as an individual. So what happens when you vote for someone who's not so popular and people already have that information uh, at hand, they could use this information to your detriment and the government um, back then was not as agreeable or the power for us to exercise democracy was not what we currently have right now. So I think I'd like to say aspect, the aspect of privacy and the laws that we have, have been put in place are sufficient. And we are slowly seeing a change come into effect with now um, elections. Um, there's the aspect of confidentiality of who we vote for as, um, as a Kenyan citizen. And, um, and uh, the, the same would not be a matter of public knowledge. 
research. Um, something else that has been done within our jurisdiction that speaks to the sufficiencies of our law is that there's a framework that has already been put in place for Kenyan citizens. So if you want to find out whether you can register with any political party, you can easily carry out the search on, on the internet. Um, there's the e-citizen government platform or through the website of the registered political party. So in instances where you find out that you've been registered to a political party that you're not affiliated, you're not uh, affiliated to any regard or respect, then in such a situation, you can actually put in the request and have your name deleted from the register of that specific political party. So I think also that's a step of us implementing the data protection framework that we have in place. The other aspect is the aspect of verification that um, Victor spoke about earlier on. Um, as an individual, as a Kenyan citizen, I can be able to log into the IABC platform and also verify my details. So this speaks to the principles of accuracy under the data protection framework. So I think the laws are sufficient. Um, what will take time is implementation. Um, and, and from the regulator's perspective, implementation needs to be staggered because we could rush the implementation process and miss the mark. Um, so implementation will take some time. I think the laws are sufficient, but we need to appreciate the fact that um, implementation will take some time. And, uh, and, and also in implementing, we also need to preserve the various relationships that we have um, within ourselves um, as a society, recognizing that um, the aspect of privacy and how we apply it will be different to how it's applied within the European context or even within the Americas, because um, we all have a different social background. So yes, that's all for me. Thank you very much, Rahab. I think you mentioned a very key aspect. The laws are there, they're sufficient, but the implementation. Probably at a later stage, I would request that you tell us how can we better this implementation process that we move from just the awareness of the laws, but move to the actual implementation where people can report and we can be able to track the achievement of how best the law has been um, um, you know, implemented. Let me come to you, Santana. Um, how much information should political parties be able to access and uh, the candidates as well about the citizens in, in an electoral cycle? Because this is a thing that I was thinking about and wanted to ask Victor earlier on that, is there some information that we give that we find unnecessary for the election? So just how much of this information, even if it's given to the electoral bodies, should be passed on to the political parties and the candidates themselves? Santana. Um, okay, thank you for the question. Uh, I'll, I'll begin with a practical example uh, okay. of one of the biggest uh, data breach uh, data breaches in our in our generation uh, by the Cambridge Analytica scandal. So, uh, whereby the persons took a personality test, uh, and then. Uh, that application that they used to take the personality test required them to log in with their Facebook accounts. So once okay. they did the personality test, the the application uh, harvested a lot of data, personal data, of those who did the test plus their friends on Facebook. So they ended up with data of about 50 million people, and so they put the likes of these people. Uh, uh, together with the information they got from the personality tests, and they used tag after that they used targeted advertising to these people, uh, political advertising to, to be specific, because uh, this influenced a lot of elections, as I know everyone is aware. So uh, back to your question. So how much data is necessary? If we look at that scandal, what was the main problem? It was the process. It was the process of acquiring that data. They were deceptive. Uh, uh, people didn't know how much that are also safeguarded against an authorized, an, an, an authorized um, access. So uh, they need to do this by, uh, like, could do uh, uh, an exercise whereby they try to log into this uh, into these systems to see if they're actually safeguarded from third party access. And another thing is they have to get consent from the from the voters to process their data. And then uh, the purpose for which they vote, uh, I mean, they process their data should be backed by law. Considering these are public bodies, the reason why they collect the data should be backed by law. So should they, sh they should be able to state a 
certain law uh, that obligates them to collect this data. And then also, uh, where possible, they should use encryption and pseudonyms for, for the data subjects who are the voters in this case. And all, all voter and member registers need to be up to date. And they should be somewhere where the voters can be able to access them. And in Kenya, we are seeing now, I, like for example, IBC sends out a link so, uh, whereby voters uh, can log in and uh, look at their, whether they are registered and look at their details. Um, another thing is, um, the data subjects should be aware of their rights. Data subjects should be aware of their rights. Uh, however, when it comes to the objecting of, of uh, the processing of their data in the, in the context of elections, this will be very limited because uh, this is a public task. So they can uh, object to the proce processing of certain data, but not all the data. So uh, to answer your question, uh, election stakeholders only need a name, identification, and address publish a register. They can also in some cases uh, get the contact details of, of the data subject. They also need the biometric data uh, to register the, the voters. They don't need personal data such as political opinions, uh, religious beliefs, sexual orientation, as this was gathered in the Cambridge Analytica scandal. They gathered all this information so they knew so much about a person that they could target them. They knew their likes, so they would target them with advertising. So the basic uh, information that they need is the identification, probably your ID number or passport number, name and address, and contact details in some cases. However, I think uh, a, a voter could object to the processing of their contact details. Thank you. Would be needed but also on the other hand someone is thinking can't the address be used for surveillance because well like you said in the beginning that most of this data unfortunately is used for surveillance and then the unsolicited adverts um, um, which is totally different from the reason why these people actually did register well time is really running against us but I need to do just information asked for and how does such an information, uh, how do we get to have the information flow better, especially the correlation between the person asking for the information and these are political parties and the implementation of the MOUs that they do sign. Victor, take it up and also you could give us your parting shots. Victor? Victor? Sorry, could you read the question? Yeah, Victor, my question is, uh, once again, I will ask, do you think some of the information that is taken for electoral purposes is, um, is, is too much or is irrelevant? And also, it, with regard to the information flow, how do we ensure that there is um, strict observance of the MOUs that are signed by these entities that are accessing the data, particularly the political parties, that they stick to what they ask the data for? And if not, what should be done? Um, thank you. I think um, um, the very first um, thing that is important is that um, uh, all, I mean, all institutions, every person is obliged to comply with the, the law, and that is the data protection law. So compliance is, first of all, paramount. Number two is that um, all citizens, all uh, members of the public need to be aware of their rights because if they don't they don't know then they won't be able to know whether they're being violated or not number three is that um, institutions oversight institutions such as um, the data protection um, commission uh, needs to be very uh, keen in monitoring abuses uh, responding um, to complaints yeah. investigating issues sorry and uh so being more um, and i think they need to have adequate budgets to enable them to investigate these cases and crack down and start finding those people who are found to be violating um the, 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 
uh, the rights of data subjects. Uh, in, and, and I think lastly, when you talk about the, the MOUs, uh, is that uh, as data, data processors and collectors, they are bound to comply with the law and they need to put in place internal mechanisms uh, to ensure that uh, they uh, have mechanisms for ensuring compliance and also ensuring redress in case there are complaints that are raised um, uh, to them. Uh, thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Victor, for that. Becca, you mentioned a very important aspect that many of these, Becca? All right, Becca, sorry about that interruption, but my question was that you raised a very important aspect that many of the laws that we do have are still at the implementation stage of awareness. How better can this be done to reach further populations and more people? And, and also how do we speed up the implementation of getting to stage of, uh, let me say complaints coming through and uh, cases probably being prosecuted? Thank you for that, Mildred. <clears throat> uh, I need to add, with Uganda, we've done uh, a, a bit of, I'll use the example of how we've gone ahead to implement that possibly uh, other countries can also uh, leverage from. One, uh, of course, our communities, they speak very many languages, so translation of the messages is key, and using the various channels which uh, they ordinarily get news from so this includes uh, using radio, according to the uh, most surveys in Africa, very many people get their information uh, from radio, but then also using the social media channels, but also partnering with other regulators or even associations uh, where these people belong because the message gets there easily and uh, it's more tailor made you know, for that particular environment. So that's one of the ways through which you know they're going beyond the awareness so generally talking about the law it can reach now for the regulators to go past the awareness is um letting people know that they actually have these rights and creating you know which has been done in kenya and also in uganda letting them know uh, using those various channels to uh, file their complaints because for the law to work to go past awareness you, the data subject, you and me, the individual whose information is being collected, we need to assert our rights. So if you see anyone that is not registered, anyone that's mishandling the information, even if it's not information particularly identifying you, please reach out to your respective um, national regulators and uh, exercise your rights. Now, the regulators when definitely receive these complaints. Now it's when the investigations will come in. But then uh, using, you know, also the existing um, associations as regulators to go beyond their awareness is that uh, we can tap into the other's uh, expertise and also the existing frameworks to uh, in investigate and also close these complaints. I'll give an example. In Uganda, we've been receiving very many complaints about uh, uh, loan apps whereby someone just downloads an application and then they are able to receive a loan. So most of them, uh, we actually established that they're in Nigeria. So working with the Nigerian uh, data protection regulator can enable us you know, to go beyond just awareness, but also to go into the enforcement. So uh, for the regulators, uh, collaboration is very key for us to be able to um, implement this law amongst others. Thank you. Mildred, we, we can't hear you. I think we're having challenges. Sorry about that. Uh, you hear. couldn't hear me? Okay, hope you can hear me now. Yes, we can. All right, Rahab, uh, uh, let me come to you. Thank you very much, uh, Baker. Rahab, you did raise the, in, the issue of sufficiency of laws, but um, laws taking time, or what will take time being the implementation. What do you think are the steps that governments can take to ensure the full implementation of these laws? Not just what is on black and white, but implement it as is in actuality. Um, thank you, Mildred, for that question. So 
I think implementation will take a couple of aspects. So what can countries do and what can governments commit to? And the first aspect I want to speak to is the allocation of resources. In order for regulators to be empowered and to exercise the independence that is guaranteed to them under the laws, under the various data protection laws that we have across Africa and across East Asia, by the government um, is one aspect that will actually assist implementation. The other aspect that will assist um, actually implementation is the aspect uh, of awareness creation. Um, so uh, a sufficiently um, empowered regulator in terms of resources and capacity um, will be able to raise awareness in, in matters of what aspects, aspects need to be complied with when it comes to observing the data. So you're able to build capacity, not only of the data subjects, but also of the various data controllers and the uh, various data processes that you have within your ecosystem. So the data controllers and data processes get to know what they need to do for them to comply with the law. And in instances where they're not certain on the compliance requirements, then the regulator can actually come in and hold their hand to enable them actually um, comply with what is required of them. And then data subjects, once the data subject is empowered and um, they're able to appreciate the, what the right of privacy actually does mean to them. They, um, in that regard, they'll be able to hold the data controllers and data processors who process their personal data accountable in instances whereby they want to enforce their rights and also in instances whereby their rights are not uh, implemented or they're not exercised in accordance to what they do provide. Um, the third aspect, I think, is collaboration. Um, previously, um, where we are coming from, um, and I'll speak to the Kenyan situation, is that regulators uh, tended to take a hard stance in that this is the law and this is what we need for you to do to comply. And ideally, that approach wasn't quite successful because it, 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 went, it would prohibit the growth and development of the specific market the regulator operates in. Um, collaboration now comes in a step further in that the regulator appreciates that in order for me to serve the specific mandate that I have under the law, I need to collaborate not only with the people that I regulate, but also other government agencies and um, the citizens, citizenry, citizenry at the end of the day for them to see an effective execution of their mandate. So I think those three things will go a long way in uh, as, uh, in uh, allowing for the effective and efficient implementation of the data protection laws that we have in our ecosystem. Elaborate one. Santana, let me come to you. What sort of KPIs do we need to set, for example, for data protection authorities to ensure that we can be able to track the success, uh, successful implementation of the laws? But also on the flip side, what sort of protection do we need to give to the data protection authorities themselves? Because sometimes in many African countries comes in the aspect of political influence. Santana, over to you. Um, thanks. I would say, okay, let me begin with the second one. Uh, that's one challenge I noted, I noted with the Data Protection Act in Kenya. Uh, the Office of the Data Protection Officer uh, might face that challenge of independence in the future because they are they're appointed by the Parliamentary Service Committee. No, the... Uh, but the parliamentary, no, not the parliamentary service committee, the, um, sorry, I've, I'll, I'll recall that, but they, they are, they are, they're appointed by the same people who appoint public officers. So there's the, the challenge of um, uh, independence. They, they may, in, in, the, in the future, they may raise the challenge of independence. So um, in terms of the KPIs, uh, I think, there's a, there's a need for us to look at how many, how many, um, looking at their roles, how many disputes have been resolved by them, disputes uh, resolved arising from the Data Protection Act, and then also to look at how much, um, have, how much uh, investigations have they initiated on their own, and also to look at the number of reports made to the Office of the Data Protection Officer, just to, that would gauge how many people are aware of the act? 
how many people are aware. So I think uh, it would be good to look at how many uh, uh, investigations have been initiated by themselves, how many reports they've received, probably uh, you can give a timeline of maybe next year, because right now is when they just have just enacted the regulations. And then also um, how many they have managed to resolve the disputes through ADR. Um, also, uh, I think it would be good to see how much uh, professional assistance they are trying to get to improve themselves. So those are the four KPIs I would give. Thank you. Grace and Fatima, as I come to you just a bit, um, for anyone who has questions that can be directed to the panelists, that will be good. Go ahead and send those in the comment section. We're going to be reading them out just shortly before we can say bye bye to our panelists. If there are any questions coming through, we will be able to answer them. But um, Grace, let me come to you as well. How do we track full implementation of these data laws that Africa has been able to enact? And also key, like what, um, uh, um, Santana talked about the independence of these data protection authorities. Um, uh, thank you. So on the question of um, tracking implementation, maybe one way to do it is also to ask ourselves, why did we make these laws in the first place? It's because there was a gap. And so, um, as much as uh, we can do things like uh, create public awareness and ask citizens to report uh, and, and make complaints, I think it's also incumbent upon the data protection uh, commissioners or authorities to do something. Um, I, for example, remember how in Kenya, the issue of uh, being registered in, um, in political parties uh, without your knowledge was such a big uh, problem. Uh, yet when it was uh, raised, for example, on social media and on radio stations and so on, um, the people seem to be told you need to report using a particular form. And to that extent, form was taking precedence over substance. And um, I thought, but when you go back to the data protection law, um, the data protection uh, authorities also have um, the mandate to undertake investigations on their own motion and to um, uh, oversee or do oversight over data protection on their own motion. So I think um, the data protection um, authorities need to uh, um, remind themselves um, of the reason why these laws were put in um, what is going on in society. And then uh, something I also noted from um, the conversations we've had here is that um, uh, we should also know that we are not operating in a vacuum and that um, we can learn from each other. And I'm glad that the colleague from Uganda has pointed out um, uh, this point. So um, uh, because our situation as Africa or Africans is nuanced, uh, and we all know that we uh, kind of transplanted these laws from another uh, jurisdiction. Um, I think the fact that, for example, Uganda started um, uh, implementing their data protection law before Kenya and Tanzania, uh, we from Kenya and Tanzania have a lot to learn from, for example, how they've done registration, what, um, what they've learned, uh, what are good practices, what are not so good practices, so that um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And um, I think uh, sessions like these ones that we're having today are good uh, for us because we, we get to, um, to share experiences, to learn from each other, uh, to organize across uh, the East African um, space where there's, a, where, where there's a space to do that because the data is not um, only being processed in Kenya, it's being processed across um, uh, the whole of East Africa, Africa and globally. So um, those are two ways uh, through which um, we could learn and uh, measure progress in, in, in data protection. Um, 
data protection uh, authorities uh, also investigating issues in the society on their own motion and also learning data protection authorities learning from from each other thank you entirely thank you very much grace for that let me go to fatma and 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 fatma yours is about um you earlier on talked about you know political parties and actors unethically accessing some of this data and then continue doing whatever they have to do that best serves their interest my, my question is who is responsible who would be responsible for such and how do we get to deal with that because we want to believe that such information is vested with the election commission of that particular country so how does that data unethically get in the hands of the wrong people for the wrong reasons how can that be termed as you give us your parting shots too uh thank you mildred uh to begin with i think i would like uh to state that uh, most of the time, maybe political parties who actually access uh, illegally, maybe the voters uh, registry, it could be they have actually gained the information from a person who works at the National Electoral Commi Commission, oh, yeah, maybe yeah, yeah, yeah. not 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 an official capacity, but maybe through corruption, you know, because uh, it's actually a big problem around, I think, African countries. It could also be that uh, this data is actually maybe obtained from a telecommunication company because they are one of the big uh, data controllers and processes in the country. It could also have been uh, maybe obtained through uh, hacking the systems or anything, maybe from uh, any person who is a data uh, controller or processor. So there are many ways uh, in which uh, the political parties would actually have obtained uh, this either it's a uh, voters data or it's actually consumer data. So the different sources whereby the political parties can actually access this data. So with regard to actually how we can curb this, I think first of all, I would like to actually point out to people who are actually collecting and processing data. It's important that uh, for organization, and even if you're a third party, uh, actually maybe engaged uh, with another entity, that you establish policies and guidelines that actually provide for how you handle that maybe in your organization or entity. And even for government institution, I think it's important that there are circulars actually providing for how uh, uh, government employees can handle personal data and actually how uh, they can curb uh, an illegal access. And also it's about having, I think, proper security into the systems to ensure that uh, it's not easy for someone to maybe illegally access the data or hack maybe your servers and have access to information that they shouldn't in the first place. But I think uh, the big, uh, the, the big uh, 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 person or entity who can actually help curb this problem will be for, okay, for Tanzania, we don't have a data protection authority in place, but for if, uh, for countries which have data protection authority, I think, I think it's imperative for them to actually take uh, this data violation seriously and make sure that such abuse are actually investigated and uh, prosecuted to the end. So it's not just about people complaining, and them receiving the complaint but not acting. They should be vibrant and be proactive and not just wait until it becomes a big issue where it's a national uh, outcry or a public outcry. They should act immediately whenever such uh, incidents happen and take action against these uh, violators or people who actually uh, mismanage or misuse uh, personal data for different uh, reasons for political or even non-political reason. So I, I will bear that burden mostly to the Data Protection Authority and also to individuals, to each one of us, since I think we also have a role to play in this. We need to be concluding this, but a special thank you to you, Fatma Songoro from Tanzania, Grace Mutungu from Kenya. Thank you so much for coming.
Victor Kapio from Kenya, uh, Santana from Kenya, as well as Rahab Juma from Kenya, and Becca as well from right here in Uganda. I want to particularly say to our Kenyan friends, we wish you the very most peaceful, great election. May the best candidate win and may peace, sanity prevail um, in the elections. At the end of the day, we'll remain Kenyans, we'll remain East Africans at that. Thank you so much for all your deliberations. I don't seem to see any questions that are coming through from online and uh, since we don't have as many uh, we have just one question coming through maybe for our panelists just before you leave let's get to see who this question is uh, targeted to if i can just have that uh, screened out for everyone else to try and find out what question um, we are paying attention to yes our technical team uh, will be giving us that but as we continue um, you can follow us on our CPIT pages uh, Strathmore University you can follow us on um, Unwanted Witness and we cannot just wait for the fourth privacy symposium Africa um, a, a symposium that is going to be happening in Nairobi Kenya that will be a great event three days of discussions and masters uh, master classes and deliberations more than 50 countries has represented more than 50 uh, you know, speakers who will be coming through. We can't wait for that. And as well, we remember well that uh, this has been the second of the kind of the regional symposiums. We first of all had the Southern Africa Symposium, which particularly was looking at a reality check of the enactment of data protection laws in Southern Africa. Today, our focus was on East and Central Africa. And uh, this was what we need to know about the digital trail, your digital trail and privacy in the era of datafication. And we can't wait for what will be happening with the North Africa Privacy Symposium, which, if not mistaken, should be coming through on the 7th of October. Let's take a look at this question uh, coming in from Rogers from Cameroon. Rogers, if I can have that uh, just um, put out. Rogers from Cameroon says, I seem to hear from a panelist that biometric data is collected. Um, I can have that a little bit enlarged uh, for a technical team for me to be able to um, read it a little well, but I think uh, Rogers is particularly looking at issues of, um, of data and uh, biometrics coming through. Now, uh, he asks, is there justification uh, for this, that he talks about um, data collected of voters in Kenya? And um, well, I, I don't seem to get that clearly. I need to draw a little bit closer and be able to get the final, the finer details of what Rogers is trying to um, get to. But I also get the, uh, guess the panelists can be able to help us answer this uh, coming through from online. But uh, we do have our poll questions that are also on and we would like to find out from our poll questions, what was the right answer to those poll questions? I'll be getting back to that uh, question coming in from Rogers at a later stage. The poll questions, what is the meaning of digital footprint? That was the question that did come through. And the answer is the names, the telephone numbers, location emails, photos, passwords about a particular person that exist on the internet as a result of their online activities. That's what we refer to as digital footprint. Another one was of what the correct tips for protecting your digital footprint where, and that is limiting the types of data that you do share, not entering personal data on public Wi-Fi, those who love to use free internet, deleting old accounts, and using an identity protection service and always updating your software. That is very key in protecting your digital footprint. And the third poll question was about what, um, which set of those were um, personal information, were not personal information collected when registering to participate in an election and none of the above. Most of that is actually collected at the end of the day. So Rogers, let me get to your question. We have just a few minutes to be closing this. He asks, this is Rogers from Cameroon. I seem to hear from a panelist that biometric data is collected to register voters in Kenya. Please, is there a justification for this? I, I think there is already biometric data collected on citizens, ID cards. So why would the state need to collect this data again? Is it not against data minimization? And I am tongue-tied on who exactly of the panelists would be able to answer this particular question because we have quite many from Kenya. But I would give a hint uh, maybe to Victor. Would you like to take this up? 
isn't this too much? Uh, from Cameroon, he is scared and saying, look here, this information is already collected on several other avenues. Victor, are you still there? Uh, um, yes, I am. Um, indeed, uh, what uh, Rogers is asking is, uh, is a problem that we have in the country. We have several databases that um, collect the data of citizens and the, the biometric database that was established. One of the reasons why um, they did that is because the law required the election management body to have its own database. Uh, but also because the civil registry, which is of the national IDs, um, had massive challenges, especially uh, in terms of the accuracy of the data. Uh, so they opted to collect their own uh, set of information to establish the register. So unfortunately, we ended up with more database, another new database with information which could have been obtained from another source, but also the national ID and passports are also used in the process of uh, registration for the biometric ID identity card. Um, so the challenge I think I've already highlighted is that we have issue of fragmentation. And also I think we have in Kenya more than 12 different databases um, across uh, the national level uh, and the election data is just but one. So it's a challenge in terms of how to harmonize the databases so that we have, um, you know, data minimization. You don't have to collect information that's, that's already been collected by another agency. And uh, that's what the government attempted to do with the Koduma number, which was a digital ID. Unfortunately, they erred on the side of minimization and um, collected even more than what was necessary. So we Strathmore University and at Unwanted Witness, you can find us on Facebook. And you can find us on Instagram, on Twitter. We are everywhere for you. Ask the questions. Let's continue with the discussion. Ask all the questions that you require to be answered, and we will ensure that we go ahead with that. Remember, November 2nd to the 4th is coming through, and that will be the fourth edition of the Privacy Symposium Africa happening in Nairobi, the beautiful Strathmore University. We can't wait to be coming through. And if you haven't registered, make sure that you visit the unwanted witness pages and make sure that you get to know how you can be able to register for this one. And our next engagement, our next regional engagement will be for West and North Africa. And like I said, that I say, and this was it for East and Central Africa discussion about privacy. And I hope that this is not just a discussion, but we're picking up lessons and we can be able to implement, especially for the 33 African countries that have the privacy laws. It's been a great pleasure. Have a beautiful evening. God bless you. We all need that personal space. We need the, the power to control who, who, who comes into that personal space. Now, for someone to come into that personal space, your personal space, they need to know one or two things about you. Essentially, personal information about you. So for someone to come into that space, they need to know your name.
privacy in simple terms is basically your personal space. We all need that personal space. We need the, the power to control who, who, who comes into that personal space. Now, for someone to come into that personal space, your personal space, they need to know one or two things about you. Essentially, personal information about you. So for someone to come into that space, they need to know your name. They need to know where you're located. They need to know a few things that identify you. So if someone knows that information, they will be able to come into that personal space and it will, it will no longer be your personal space. That means your personal space is infringed, so your privacy is abused, especially when you don't give them permission to get into that personal space. Many of the data collectors that we assessed last year were collecting this data without due regard to the law. They would not tell their customers what information they have on them. They would not tell them where they keep that information. They would not seek for their consent. So customers would go for their services, but they would be trading their privacy or their personal information with the convenience of the service. So as you go for a ride, as you go for food, the company retains personal data. But also we realize that a lot of this personal information is kept outside Uganda without the knowledge of their customers. So the report essentially was aimed at letting customers know that someone is collecting your personal data or uh, sharing it with someone else without your consent. So with this campaign, we want to encourage data collectors to comply. We have the law. If you're collecting that, data, that personal data, be transparent. If you're collecting that personal data of your customers, be accountable. Collect what you need and retain it for a minimum period.